uh, and we will get back to you. Um, so, hi, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is Emerson Blaze. And we're going to talk with you guys today about applying to universities in the US and the UK. Um, so feel free to um, drop any uh, questions or comments uh, in the chat below, and we'll be sure to get back to you as soon as we can. Um, so let's get started. Um, okay, so uh, here's what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to actually understand all of the different requirements that you need to go through. Uh, we'll even take you through school selections, uh, forming school lists. Um, a lot of people worry about, you know, uh, having a balanced school list of, of the so-called safeties, targets, and reaches, uh, but there are some different options that you can do to make sure that uh, it fits you uh, best and your school list fits you best. Um, and so we will do that. We'll also actually show you about writing the personal statements, um, the U.S. side versus the U.K. side. Um, they're very different uh, essays, and so we'll show you actually some samples for those as well. Um, and then we'll talk about the deadlines and everything you can do um, to submit. Uh, we will also save some stuff if you're if you're looking at the U.S. side. We'll also save some time for a quick overview of uh, the SAT and the ACT and what you need to do to actually uh, make your choice which one's best for you. Um, okay, so why are we here? Uh, well, when it comes to university applications, um, really the the U.S., the Ivy League, and the Russell Group or Oxbridge in the UK uh, pretty much dominate the uh, admissions conversations. Um, you know, you can take a look at the, the, the world top 50. This is just one ranking um, from the QS this, year, uh, this coming year for 2022. Um, and you can look at a few other rankings. Of course, they vary from, you know, uh, ranking to ranking. They, they each have their own sort of qualifiers and uh, data sets that they use. Um, but you can kind of see the point of this is that when you're thinking of top tier universities around the world, you really do look at some in the US and the UK. Uh, that doesn't really mean to say that HKU or um, you know, uh, NUS in Singapore or other uh, universities around the world aren't great opportunities, but uh, we're gonna focus on the US and UK today. Uh, if you do have any questions about uh, applying to uh, HKU or even some of the Aussie uh, universities in the process for that, definitely feel free to drop some questions in the chat um, and let us know. Okay, uh, so uh, this is from uh, this past sort of admission cycle you can see here. Um, the statistics sort of speak for themselves. Uh, the application numbers are just getting larger and larger and larger. You can see that some of these applications are in the hundreds of thousands for just one school. Um, and then the percentages are quite low. Um, you can kind of see that Oxford in comparison to someplace like NYU or UCLA um, is, you know, it's a much lower number, 23,000 compared to 139,000 um, applications. But you'll see that the percentages are kind of like roughly, they roughly equal out to the same numbers of being, people being admitted, right? So you look at some place, um, you know, like Princeton, where it's only 3%, where they'll have, you know, tens of thousands of applications. Oxford might be 15%, but the numbers still work around, you know, to be about two, 3,000 people in total. Um, for the entire admission cycle. So, you know, you kind of see that it's just getting more and more competitive and we want to help you guys sort of like beat those, uh, beat those numbers and um, get ahead. So we're going to go through and break down the Common App and the UCAS. Uh, the Common App is the name of the US one and the UCAS is the name of the UK one. Uh, we'll get into some of these formats here. Um, yeah, so uh, on the left, you see the US obviously, and I'll go through that one. Um, the common application just gives you hundreds and hundreds of universities. Um, there's no limit to how many universities you can actually choose, and this is quite different to, uh, from the UK. Um, but you will want to consider, especially mom and dad, you want to consider the application fees. Um, for each application, you will need to pay a separate fee. Um, and for international applicants, this can be over 100 US dollars. So if you're choosing 10 schools, it starts to add up. Could you do 20 schools? Yes, but think about the cost uh, and think about the time it takes to actually complete those applications. Um, one of the interesting things though about the US uh, application is that you don't necessarily need to declare a program. You don't need to say what your major is. Uh, you can simply uh, apply as undeclared. Um, alternatively, you can actually, in, for some schools, you can actually choose multiple or discuss multiple uh, majors 
in your application essays and, and these sorts of things. So um, if you're having trouble uh, deciding, you know, if you're 17, 18 years old and you don't know what you want to do with your life or what kind of career path you want to go down, um, the U.S. application is a really nice sort of hedge where you can enter without necessarily choosing a major. Um, this is also really interesting because you can apply to a really competitive school, let's say like NYU we just saw, and not apply for business school. And you can actually end up trying to go for business school, which is even more competitive, maybe once you're already in NYU. You're already on campus, you're already accepted, then you can actually switch your major, change your major into business later on. And since you're already a student, you actually have an increased chance of gaining entry into uh, uh, Stern School of Business at NYU. Um, be careful though, uh, SAT, ACT test scores may be required. Um, you know, if you take a look here, uh, U.S. universities these days, especially because of uh, closures and test centers being closed for COVID and these sorts of things, a lot of the universities in the U.S. have decided to make these test scores optional or uh, not require them whatsoever. Um, but just be aware that when uh, something is optional, uh, do it, right? Because if it comes down to, um, you know, uh, if I'm applying and Cecily's applying, I don't do the SAT, she does do the SAT, that gives her an extra chance to get me, uh, get her that spot over me. Um, so always, it's always good to have a test score in your back pocket. Um, and then you would put that through the US comment. Yeah. Um, we always say as well, it's, it's quite funny, the US and the UK systems for applying to university couldn't be more different in any way. The UK is, is completely different. So. Uh, the way to apply is through, as we said, UCAS, um, which is essentially one service um, and one portal that allows you to apply to all of your universities. Um, so this is all in um, universities for the UK. And UCAS, you submit one uh, application, which gives you access to five uh, applications within that. So what I mean by that is you write one personal statement, you put all of your information in once, you put one reference in, and that goes out to five uh, of your choices. Now they could be uh, five different universities. They could be five different courses. It could be three courses at one university to others, uh, but just five. You can do less than five, but five is the maximum. One of the major differences between um, studying a university in the US and the UK is in the UK, you do declare your major field of study or studies. So you can do joint honors. You could do two subjects together, law and economics, for example, two subjects like that could go together. Um, but you definitely are more streamlined in the UK system. So if you um, do law, then you will come out with a law degree. You can't get to the end of your second year and kind of think, mm, you know, actually, I want to choose to maybe focus on this now. You, you, you decide at the start, you decide when you submit your UCAS, and that's what you'll graduate with. So the UK is definitely more suited for those of you that know, I want to do medicine, uh, I want to do law, I want to do this. That's definitely a more suitable thing. As Emerson said, if you're kind of unsure the US is probably your, your better option. Um, so yeah, one personal statement uh, that goes to five. Admissions tests are not required. We don't have an SAT or ACT equivalent, um, but for some subjects, as it says there at the bottom law, for example, medicine, there are admissions tests um, that will be required. Other institutions, other courses may um, have their, their own exams or, Con or requirements. Conservatories, right, conservatories right. for performances. Yeah. yeah, but they will be in touch about that when you submit your application, they'll then be in touch to say, thank you, we'd now like you to take X, Y, and Z test. So uh, yeah, definitely a more streamlined uh, and together kind of portal, but very, very different to the US. Okay. Uh, right, so this is just a quick breakdown for the US side because um, you can choose unlimited. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you will. Um, and um, you think about your school counselors. So international school counselors um, here in Hong Kong will typically support every single student in the school. They'll support them for 10 applications. Um, this is because 10 is a nice round number, but also they're busy. There's a few hundred students that are doing their applications and the counselors might feel overwhelmed. Again, this is a reason why we help so many families and students because the admissions counselors at high school don't have the time to do everything. But typically, if you are going through your high school counselor here in Hong Kong, they will discuss 10 applications with you and help you go through those. So why 10? So if you look on the right hand side of the screen, one of the application, as Cecily said, goes to all five schools. That's just one application. 
And then you have nine other sort of choices. So another one that you might want to do is apply to California. Um, if, you, if you choose California as one of your schools, you actually get all nine different campus options in that uh, University of California um, choice. So that means Berkeley, UCLA, San Diego, and all of these other places that are really great schools all throughout California. So already just with two applications, you've got potentially 14 schools, and you can really make the most of choosing some, some targets, some reaches, and this sort of thing. Um, with the other eight, you know, if you want to stick in the U.S., make sure that you do balance it out. I see so many people sort of um, working with their parents or working with their, their children and only choosing Ivy Leagues, only choosing the best of the best because uh, that makes for good conversation at T, right? And these sort of things are really impressive if you're looking at top 25, top 50. But you have to remember just how big the United States are. Uh, the top 50 schools, most of them are just in New England. You know, they're on the East Coast. And that doesn't even really include schools all around the rest of the country. You know, you even think of the Midwest, like Chicago is a great school as well. Everybody knows that. Um, but there are so many other schools in the United States. And so make sure that you are well aware of all these different options when, and, and you sort of balance those, balance those eight. Um, so here's just a quick example of how you might go through uh, and make sure that you are balanced. Um, some of the things that you might wanna consider uh, this is, you know, a potential flashcard that you would use to understand uh, NYU. Um, so obviously the location is a massive thing. Oh, thank you. Uh, the location is a massive issue for a lot of people. It's in New York City. Uh, you're right by Washington Square Park. Um, it's a really sort of student-centered area, you know, great restaurants, but then also job opportunities, internship opportunities. Um, you can invite your friends to come travel and when, whenever that opens up. And, you know, you've got a lot of airports around there too. Um, but, you know, as far as the campus culture is concerned, you're more of like a, another person in a big city. Um, this is somewhat similar, and, and obviously, I think Cecily will talk more about this too, but when you think about being a student in London, um, you're just another person on, uh, on the tube. You're just another person walking over Waterloo Bridge or wherever, and you don't really have a university campus atmosphere with NYU because it's, it's New York City. Um, and so you don't really get, you know, there's no sports stadiums, there's no real um, uh, big sort of like uh, uh, area that's that's dedicated to students in that one way. It's sort of spread around, and that might affect your decision. Uh, obviously, the academics are going to be great. Look at the different programs. There's a large variety of programs at NYU, but do they have yours? Um, a lot of parents also look into university brands. Uh, this is going to cost a lot of money. You can see that tuition the last year is fifty-three thousand dollars a year. Um, and that adds up. That's absolutely insane when you compare it to the UK or other parts of Europe and Asia, um, where it's much, much cheaper. So you are paying a high price for NYU. Uh, make sure they have your program. And, and, and the brand is obviously important, but um, listen to your heart and make sure that you do consider um, whether or not that is the best choice uh, for you. Um, just a quick profile here on probably the most Famous university in England. I forgot to say with the UCAS uh, application previously, two of the most famous universities in England, Oxford and Cambridge, within your five UCAS applications, you are only allowed to apply for one. It's a strange historic um, rule that means you can only apply to Oxford or Cambridge. The other five options you apply to, nobody can see who else you've applied to. So you apply to Case, uh, King's College in London, they have no idea who else you've applied to. But Oxford and Cambridge have this weird kind of power over other universities in which they uh, set a rule that says you either apply to Oxford or Cambridge. So just worth bearing in mind if you're looking at what we call Oxbridge, which is the, the two of them together. Um, so yeah, Oxford is one of the, uh, in fact, probably the oldest university in England. Very, very rich history, very traditional um, university, so much so that graduation ceremonies are still conducted in Latin, entirely in Latin. Um, so, uh, Oxford is about an hour on the train from central London. Oxford is a really lovely place in England. Uh, I think it's a great location because you're out of London, but you're, you're close enough to get in pretty quick. Um, campus culture, it really, uh, differs campus culture across universities in England, but certainly somewhere like Oxford and Cambridge, I think we're going to come on to, to mm -hmm. campus cultures a little bit more, but mm -hmm. certainly, um, academics are the utmost uh you know of the utmost importance uh, somewhere like oxford you know 
Um, there's still certainly things like sports and societies, but uh, campus culture, I'd say is a, there's a strong academic focus, academic difficulty. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very um, academic college. Um, and, you know, as you can see there on the right within the key facts, the average A-level acceptance will be AAA. That's the average. I would probably say most courses would be looking at at least one or two A-stars at A-level within that. Um, so, yeah, very, very academic school. Uh, programs offered really good selection, you know, from law to natural sciences, lots of different courses offered. And the university brand, I think the name speaks for itself. It's known all around the world. It's in the top five uh, worldwide. Going to the University of Oxford will set you on such a wonderful path for the rest of your career because it's such a well-known institution. Um, so I wrote a few key facts. I think I've gone over most of the top five worldwide. Oxford's made up of colleges. So when you apply to Oxford, you must apply to a college. Each college kind of has its own little uh, unique selling point. Uh, some of them are uh, female only. Uh, some of them don't offer certain colleges. So when looking at Oxford, definitely worth uh, looking into what the different colleges mean and what they're all about. Um, as you can see, there are a really high percentage of inter international students. Um, people from all around the world want to go to Oxford. Um, it's, a, it's, it's that well known. And I mentioned there the location. So, uh, just a quick profile on, on Oxford, uh, certainly a, a fantastic university. Hmm. All right, and this is kind of, you know, uh, where we help you guys decide which one's best for you. <laughs> um, there are so many great schools in the UK, so many great schools in the US. Um, this is the campus life that Cecily alluded to. Um, one of the major deciding factors comes down to, you know, um, it is, it could be a financial decision, uh, it could be uh, a number of programs or if you actually get accepted, obviously. Um, but as far as the actual lifestyle and, and, and seeing which one is the right fit for you, um, the U.S. campus life is a lot more, I would say, school spirited in general. Um, obviously, this can come down to, you know, these specific schools. NYU is in a big city. You're, you're not as much. But for UCLA, you're going to see students. You're going to be walking around campus and people are going to be in UCLA gear from head to toe. Um, there's a lot of school spirit. There's tons of sporting events that everybody goes to. Um, the campus is beautiful. Uh, it's, you know, uh, really great quality of life uh, out there in LA and, and Westwood. Um, and, you know, the other aspects are sort of like the intangibles. I know this seems a little bit weird, and I don't know if you guys can see this on the presentation, but, you know, things like nationally ranked meal plans come into play. There are actually like they do take this very seriously. And one of the reasons why it costs so much is that there's a lot of value added into these programs. You know, there will be several student gyms and, and um, you know, uh, local, uh, the movie theater sort of on campus, auditoriums and all these sort of study spaces you can get. And so the campus resources, just because the, you know, the U.S. is so big, they're, they're spread out a lot and there's a lot to offer. But again, you are really um, paying for that price. Yeah. Um really different uh, at the UK. I, I'm almost envious of what you describe actually oh. because I think it sounds so fun and even in Hong Kong you see people walking around with the, the branded t-shirts. We don't really have that kind of um, strong campus life in the UK. I think it's certainly when you go to a university that's not a London-based one that's more campus-based that there is that but um, certainly not got quite the, the sports culture that, that they have in the States. Um, so highly academic, specialized, international and professional campus atmospheres we've written there. Um, it's also shorter than the US. So you do three undergraduate years, there are options to do fours. You can do what we call like a year abroad or a sandwich year in your third year. You could do a year in industry. You could do an exchange, go and study uh, abroad somewhere. Uh, but generally your undergraduate degree will last for three years. Um, the holidays at UK universities are unbelievable yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. have so much time so you'll start uh, end of september beginning of october before you know it you're back for christmas start of december you're back in january and then it's kind of the slightly what feels longer term um then you'll have about a month off at easter and then you have sort of three to four months off in the summer which is great because it really gives you an opportunity to get some experience uh in the working world in you know over three four months in the summer travel if that's what you want to do um but it does give you a lot of time to invest in yourself. And it's it's definitely, um, well, I, I definitely advise students I know that are at university or going to university to use your summers wisely. Um, compared to the States, 
low tuition costs for sure yeah. for international students it's considerably lower um and yeah so different universities have different brands they have different traditions like i said oxford has some really sort of historic traditions that they i don't think will ever change other universities have uh different ones um and we mentioned before that if you know what you want to do you know your career plan you've got your dream job in mind you know i absolutely want to be a lawyer i absolutely want to be a, a, a surgeon um the uk is probably your better option it will get you there quicker it'll streamline you there um and before you know it you'll be getting onto the next steps of qualifying for the for the career that you want so yeah i think that's really important because i think part of the the four-year experience in the us you know you you have on that extra year that extra cost it delays you from getting into the workplace and begin earning that paycheck or developing your passion um and that is kind of like one of the trade-offs where you don't have to declare a major right away. You're maybe taking much more time to decide, um, you know, can you graduate in under four years? Yes, but the system isn't really in your favor of doing that. And I think that one of the major benefits of the UK universities, I have to really agree with Cecily, is that you can focus so much and really hit the ground running with your career path and get out. Um, all those great holidays with the, the uh, career experience, internships um, uh, really do help, yeah. Um, right. Uh, okay, so this is one of the, I think, the day-to-day -day things that we do the most, right? So obviously choosing your schools and considering what, what programs are the best fit for you, you know, is it the US, is it the UK? Maybe you're applying to both and you're going to see where you can land, right? What schools can you get into, right? If I can get into Oxford, I'm going to go to Oxford. If I can get into Stanford, I'm going to go to Stanford in the US and maybe you're just looking for the best situation. So you'll probably do both applications. And like we said, with your school counselors, the school counselors will help you do both, right? One of those applications will be the UK, and that gets you all five of your programs. Uh, and then you can mix up those other nine for the US, and, and no matter what you do, there's going to be this essay. So let me explain what's going on with the US one. So the common application essay, every single school sees it. So who cares, what does that mean? Uh, it means that you can't speak directly to each school, right? So you need to actually uh, have more of a creative story going on. Um, it's a personal narrative. Um, there are, you know, I'll talk more about this in a minute, but um, it's not really focused on your subject at all because you might be undeclared. You're not really talking about the subject. It's not really focused on individual schools because every school sees it. So you can't focus on one school. So um, this does go into what you write and how you write it. Uh, it's a hundred, uh, sorry, 650 word limit. Um, you do not have to reach the limits uh, if you do have a good ending to your story. I'll show you some of these questions later and you'll see what I mean by a story. Um, and then on top of that, you will have supplementary essays. So this is where a lot of people lose the most time. This will end up taking you, you know, two months, maybe three months to complete all the supplemental essays. So the common application, you have one essay that everybody sees, everybody reads. Um, and then for every single individual school, they get to ask you their own questions and they can ask you whatever they want. And you will have to answer those individual ones and it takes a lot of time. So again, you could do unlimited schools if you really wanna pay for it, uh, but also it just takes time. So you will have to develop all of these different essays. Um, but what's good about the supplemental ones is that only that individual school sees it, right? So you can actually speak directly to NYU, you can actually speak directly to Chicago or Princeton or whatever it is, and tell them why you're such a good fit or why the program is such a good fit for you uh, and answer whatever questions they have. But I just, I really have to say that that takes the most amount of time, uh, especially when you get up to, you know, uh, eight, nine, 10 schools. Um, so set aside two months at least to do the supplemental essays. Yeah. Um, for the UK, I've mentioned one, essay um says they're only 500 words which um doesn't uh seem like a lot but it's 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 a challenging um statement to write because there's so much to get in you need to be concise you've got to sell yourself uh in 500 words it's 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 a difficult ask uh certainly for students that have a lot of experience have got a lot to say um it is difficult to to get everything into 500 words um the prompt is tell us why you're applying Tell us why you're applying. I think we're going to come on to a, a, another slide about um, what, yeah. what goes in exactly, but it's incredibly broad. Um, but there are certain things that um, admissions tutors, admissions teams are looking for. 
Uh, no supplementary essays required, so uh, very different to the US. It does say it there at the bottom, Oxbridge does. There'll also be other courses that uh, will ask for certain things. Let's say you're applying for something like architecture, maybe something a bit more arts-based. You'll be yeah. uh, like a portfolio or something yeah. might be required. Uh, proof of some work, some design, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly across the board, it's just one statement, 500 words. It does get read. I've worked in admissions teams before. I've worked in what we call clearing before. It's a really important 500 words. So definitely worth investing the time in it um, and getting it right. All right. Um, so let's take a look at uh, some of the US questions. And you can see that these are going to be very different from the uh, UK one. We'll also take a look at some samples from students who are successful. Um, so here is the common application, uh, personal statement question choices. Uh, you only have to choose one. And again, it's 650 words. But let's take a look at some of these questions. Do you have a good story to tell? Um, you know, have you ever learned from an obstacle? Can you describe some moment of growth? You know, why did you grow? What happened after? Um, and so all of these questions are sort of questions that don't really have a clear answer, right? And uh, in fact, if you look down at number seven, that prompt number seven is always, if none of these prompts fit you, or if you feel like you have a better story to tell or a different story to tell, you can write literally anything. Um, so there's a lot of freedom in the, the US um, Common App essay, but that can actually be terrifying because there's no real sense of direction. Should I do this? Should I do that? Um, everybody's different. One of the most important things you can do is try to answer multiple questions or write multiple drafts and see which draft you, know, uh, you have a better story for. Um, essentially, you are the main character in your story. Um, you can have other characters, friends, um, uh, you know, people from your life, um, and there can be things like, you know, monologue, dialogue, uh, you know, similes, metaphors, and, and these sorts of things. It's a very creative writing um, experience, and I will show you uh, an example here in a minute, um, but uh, this does challenge people. Um, you can't just list accomplishments. You're not talking about a program whatsoever, um, and it is very creative. So some of the key tips you can see on the right, keep it casual. Um, I would say don't make too many jokes, but jokes are certainly important. And, and you know, make sure that you do kind of have a voice and a brand in there for yourself. Um, you want something memorable. Um, you know, some of these challenges, if you're answering, you know, number three, um, you know, have you ever faced a challenge? Number two, have you ever uh, learned something from an, from an obstacle? Um, have, have a moment of, you know, funny failure where, where something silly happens to you or or, you know, there's some self-effacing humor, but for the most part, you want to think of like what kind of character you portray yourself as, um, almost as if you're the character of, of the, the TV show or the movie or something like that. So um, have some sort of entertaining voice, make sure that you come off and as a character you want them to see. Um, and then I would also say try multiple prompts to ensure that you've chosen the best one for you. Um, so here's a quick one right here. Um, you can kind of see this is from Johns Hopkins University uh, by a student named Stephanie. Um, and I've bolded some of the things in here so you can take a look at the language and some of the things that Stephanie does in this. Um, I'll let you guys read through this. Again, if you do want a copy of the PDF or if you'd like a copy of this video, um, please do let us know uh, and we'll get that over to you so you can take a more uh, personal look or slow this down a little bit. But you can see that Stephanie in here is a character, right? Uh, she's using the first person, I, right? In short, I wanted to save the world. I, at first I despaired, then I realized I'm not a superhero um, and these sorts of things. So she is the main character. She's describing, you know, these different sort of powerful Greek goddesses, these mythical, be uh, mystical, beautiful beings. Um, and she's having fun with it, right? But, you know, there is a clear theme here, right? There is a clear theme. She's not a superhero. She can't do everything, but she still wants to, and she's still going to try. And she says there, this is obviously not the whole essay, but you can see towards the bottom of this, and yet I want to save the world. So she's clearly characterizing herself as uh, an ambitious young lady um, and you know, with a sense of determination, she's not gonna give up. Um, she's flexible and that she, she shifts her definitions of what it means to be a hero. Um, and this is really sort of a great example of what you would wanna do as, as far as the common app. Uh, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Um, as much as they care about who you are as a person, um, it's not a personal piece of writing. It's a formal piece of writing. It's not the time to show off your creative writing. That that is not what the personal statement is. Um, it's not a time for jokes or sort of um, metaphors for your life, anything like that. Um, it really, 
it says it there, past, present, future. That's really how I ask students to structure the essay. What have you done up until this point that's made you who you are and has got you ready for the subject you're going to study? Um, what are you doing right now at school and in your life that, that shows you're passionate about the subject? Where do you want to go with the subject? The subject's really at the core of it. Everything has to be about what you've been doing, what you're doing for the subject and what you want to do. Uh, so your personal interest, let's, let's imagine we're doing a law personal statement. Your personal interest in law, uh, what area of law, where's this interest come from? You need to show your enthusiasm and your passion for the subject. They've got so many people applying to do law. What is your particular passion for law? What is it exactly that you like about it? Um, what are you doing at school to, to help invest um, in your passion for the subject? It's really important that you get some volunteer work, uh, maybe an internship or some kind of shadowing experience into the personal statement. Um, a lot of students realize this too late, yeah. um, but I try and tell my students from quite early on, you know, use this summer to get something you can write on your personal statement. Um, any key achievements and any skills and abilities. Um, they do want to hear if it's relevant about your sports, uh, about your hobbies, but really if it's not relevant to the subject, if you can't make it into, if you can't convert it to show why that will help with your subject, it's probably not worth getting into those 500 words. Um, so I always get students to start with putting the subject in the middle, almost like a, a mind map or something, and we go from there. Uh, but yeah, formal piece of writing, although it's a very broad prompt, um, there is a bit of a structure to it and there are certain things you've got to get in and that they're looking for yeah um so here's an example um this person was applying to geography um so as you can see there the first paragraph uh given a bit of introduction to the subject uh what is geography to them what does it mean what does it encompass why does that fascinate them um why do they want to study um so they, they, that's what they've gone on to say, it will enhance my ability to tackle the imminent problems such as overpopulation. So the first bit there is, is all about sort of situating the subject you want to study in relation to the world, in relation to your world. Um, and then they've moved on there to talk a little bit about their studies. Um, I think one of the uh, notes on the, the previous slide was to name names. And I sort of brushed over that, but that is really key. And in the second paragraph here, you can see they've gone on to do that. I'm a member of the Royal Geographical Society. I've attended lectures, and there they name um, somebody's lecture they've attended uh, and exactly what the lecture was on. It's just really good to get in, whether it's the name of a, um, a professor, whether it's the name of a book, whether it's the name of a podcast you listen to, anything. Um, what are you doing that shows that you are really invested in this subject? Um, so just a quick snippet there, but you can definitely see totally different style. Um, very formal, uh, nothing sort of hypothetical, no kind of imagined situations. It's a pretty serious and academic piece of writing. Yeah, um, I think um, with these things, if you see in this example about attending a lecture or doing an event and, you know, uh, we have so many students who uh, will do shadowing programs. I think shadowing is such a great opportunity. And a lot of people worry like, oh, I can't get an internship. I can't get a job opportunity because I'm 17 years old, I'm 18 years old. Um, yeah, that's true. Look into shadowing opportunities. But for people who are worried that, you know, everything's closed or, you know, I can't really do too much. That's simply not true. There's so many virtual learning opportunities you can attend as well. So join in on lectures or conferences or talks. There's so much stuff online these days. Um, you don't even need to participate. You don't need to be um, someone who's asking questions or, or speaking at a conference or any of these things. You need to be there. Take some notes. Write down what you've learned. Uh, write down how you hope to apply what you've learned in the program. So um, really strongly consider shadowing programs, as Cecily mentioned, but then don't forget that there's a lot of virtual opportunities if you can't actually uh, attend a lecture or anything like that. Especially nowadays, it's not it's all yeah. virtual things now. Yeah. Um, these statements here, you know, kind of a little bit of a joke. Can I be cliche? Don't be cliche. What does it mean to be cliche? Uh, it means to say these sort of catchphrases um, that aren't really true, but they're sort of overused. You know, from a young age, I have always wanted to be a lawyer. Really? Really? You went, you were, you were a little kid and you're running around saying that I want to be a lawyer. For as long as I remember, I don't really think that. I've always been, throughout my life, I've always enjoyed. These things are unbelievable. Okay. So, be a little bit more realistic. Try to avoid cliches by, 
you know, as, as said, Sully mentioned, listing real names, going through and saying things that you've done or books that you've read, um, essays you've written, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. Nobody will believe that you've always wanted to do it. Um, so instead of lying, um, try to just be a little bit more realistic. Did you start something in, you know, grade nine, year 10, right? Was it, was it the summer before your, your sophomore year, or was it the winter break when you did it? You know, this is much more realistic and it lets people know that you're not joking around. It was a little bit uh, more believable uh, in, in that sense. Um, oh, yeah. Um, so in the UK, um, some subjects and some institutions will require an interview. So it does vary, uh, but generally if you're applying to medicine, dentistry, nursing, education, music, art and design, um, you will be required to have an interview. Um, certainly something like music and art and design, it's a chance to sort of show your portfolio, talk about the inspiration of your work, that sort of thing. Um, STEM subjects, social sciences, not so much, uh, but certainly Oxbridge will always ask for an interview, whatever subject it is. Uh, so for example, if you are doing social science at Oxford, you will be required to have an interview. Uh, it does really vary, but that's just generally across the board. Uh, but obviously nowadays interviews are much easier than they used to be. They'll all be conducted on Zoom. So it's not something to sort of factor in. I had a student a few years ago that went to the UK for an interview, but that's not needed nowadays. The UK interviews, um, they really vary. It can be anything quite general from why do you want to study at this university? Um, subject specific questions like uh, perhaps what exactly in medicine do you want to specialize in? Um, what is it about education that you are passionate about? So something you know to do with economics, very specific, let's say. Um, why you and what did you enjoy most about your A-levels? But, but, but really preparation for interviews is key. Um, planning for these kind of questions, planning responses, reading around your subject. They'll often ask you about your subject in the world, your subject in the news right now. Um, so just bear in mind that you could be asked to do uh, interviews, certainly if you're applying to something like law, and certainly if you're applying to Oxbridge, an interview, um, and, and actually the top London universities too, you'll, you'll no doubt be asked for an interview. So preparation is key and showing uh, you know, a bit of passion for the subject, a bit of charisma, a confidence, really important. Okay, and uh, this is sort of just a little uh, rundown of the timelines, guys. Um, so again, it's not possible to read all of this right now. Okay, so uh, if you would like a copy of the PDF the video, as I've said before, please just let us know. But uh, in general, August 1st is, every year is going to be when the common application uh, is going to be open. Um, no, yeah, actually, oh, wow, tomorrow, yeah, um, tomorrow, and then uh, I know we haven't talked much about early decision, there's just really not uh, enough time in the world, so if you do have questions about early decision, let me know, um, is just after Halloween, October 31st, on November 1st, uh, the California application does open, like I said, you can do nine schools there, and if you take a quick look, it's only open for the month of November, so if you are doing your California application, you do get nine schools, but it's just open for that one month, so please be prepared. Um, in general, uh, January 1st is when you need to have everything in. Uh, are there other schools that have later deadlines? Yes, of course. So look into your individual schools. Um, I know uh, the University of Michigan, for example, uh, typically goes into February for uh, its application deadlines. Um, but starting tomorrow, uh, the Common App will be open and ready for submission. And you could start drafting, looking at those questions and beginning your journey into the US universities. So we've got a, so we've got a timeline here for UCAS. Um, so generally uh, September is, um, so, so from May, you can register for UCAS, which means setting up an account. You cannot apply to any universities there. You cannot uh, submit your personal statement, but you can register for an account name, email address, address, that sort of thing. Uh, start of September, the uh, UCAS opens for submission, so that's when you can apply to a school, put your personal statement in. I always advise students to just get it done as early as possible, certainly in the final year of school, things get really busy. Use the summer to get your personal statement done and get it in September time. It's worth bearing in mind for Oxbridge, it's middle, second, third-ish week of October, usually this year it's 15th of October. Um, Oxford and Cambridge require their applications in sooner. Um, this is partly due to the fact that interviews are required. Interviews are usually around December, January time. 
um, but also because they want their students to be uh, prepared and ahead uh, and get the applications done. Everything closes in January. Um, and then by then you, you get offers on a rolling basis. So you might get an offer in October, another one in, in January. The universities just offer places out as and when applications come in. Um, so it's worth getting the application in as soon as possible. Um, again, as Emerson said, we don't have time to go over everything. There is a thing called clearing, um, which is um, a little bit complicated to explain, but essentially it means if you don't get an offer from the university that you want, or perhaps your exam results aren't quite what you wanted, there are still options. There are still places. Universities will always have places left and they do put them up uh, on their websites. And if you have a UCAS account, you can apply um, all those places. But generally September and January are the, the months to bear in mind. Uh, so in general, what if something is optional? Do it. Uh, can I submit applications before I get my test scores? Yes, if you're looking into, I will talk in a moment about the SAT, ACT very briefly. Um, uh, yes, you can submit applications anytime you want and then send test scores or choose not to send your test scores um, anytime you please. Uh, can I break my early decision offer? I know we haven't had time to get into early decision too much. Um, in short, the answer is yes, if you don't go to the United States. So let's say I get an early decision offer with, um, uh, let's say NYU, which is a really great school. Obviously, we've been talking about NYU a little bit today, but as it turns out, Cecily helped me with my uh, UCAS personal statement and we did a really good job and I actually got into Cambridge and I'm really worried. Am I stuck? Do I have to go to NYU even though I got into Cambridge? No. Um, the early decision um, uh, sort of deal is, is not binding in a legal sense. Um, so what you would do is you just write an email to NYU, write an email to the university and say, Actually, I've decided to pursue a university uh, program in the United Kingdom. I'm not going anywhere in the United States. I'm not choosing any other universities. So don't worry, NYU. I'm not, I'm not choosing another school in California or something. I'm actually going to the UK. Um, and they'll, they'll say, thank you for letting us know. Just let them know so they can give the, the place to somebody else who's really working to, to get it. Yeah. Um, and a few ones for UCAS. Uh, do I need to choose all my school's courses at once? Um, courses? because the personal statement is one essay um you can't apply for three courses in medicine and then decide you want to do a couple of economics because you can't change your personal statement you can't give another personal statement so courses uh you can't really change your courses but certainly once UCAS opens you do not need to apply to all five at once you could submit three applications in September to let's say Kings Manchester and Durham and then you might attend an open day or something in October, November at um, the University of Bristol and think, I love Bristol, I'm gonna put one in for Bristol. So uh, you don't have to do it all at once. It's very difficult to really change your course too much because the personal statement is one piece of writing. Conditional, unconditional offers. So once you um, apply, the school, the university will reply back to you with a conditional offer generally. This is when you haven't taken your exams yet. So. We will give you a place on the condition that you get AAA at A level. Um, unconditional offers are if you have done your exams, you've done your IB, you've done your A levels, um, and then you're applying. Then it would be unconditional because you are on no uh, condition to get in. But generally, you will be receiving conditional offers. Uh, and clearing, I sort of touched on previously, but clearing is essentially when universities advertise all the places they've got left. So, um, for example, let's say LSE have uh, 250 places on their law course. Um, they give out 250 offers, but only 220 students confirmed and went there. They thought this would not happen, but they have 30 places left. They put them in clearing. Uh, it's then sort of a calling up situation, emailing, saying, I've seen this place. I'd like to, um, I'd like to apply for that place through clearing. Um, so, yeah. But clearing is like a, uh, a backup. Mm -hmm. All right. So very briefly, guys, because the <laughs> SAT, ACT, I know, is an important part of this. And, you know, we've done this presentation uh, in the past where people do have a lot of SAT, ACT questions. Um, again, there's a lot of information here. Uh, if you'll notice, the, the test dates are down at the bottom. These are international test dates. So please keep these test dates in mind as far as, you know, when you hope to take the exam, what are your actual opportunities to take the exams? 
uh, these exam scores are good for two years. So if I take the SAT um, this year, August 28th, I still have two years to apply to university using that score. Uh, you can take the SAT as many times as you like, the ACT as many times as you like, just prepare, sign up, make sure the scheduling works and you're good to go. Um, some of the key considerations as far as like which one's better for you is, you know, the speed, um, the SAT, it gives you a lot more time for the English and the math, the math, you can use calculator and there's another one without a calculator um, versus the ACT. Um, the SAT does not have an essay section. They've eliminated that for the upcoming fall 2021. There's no longer an essay section. Whereas in the ACT, there is an essay section. Um, the science section in the SAT, uh, ACT, uh, that might be a key determining factor. So if you look down here in the middle, how do I choose? Um, are you going for a STEM program? Um, maybe the ACT is actually better for you. If you can ace that science section, you can actually prove that you belong in a great competitive um, program um, and, and find out. Uh, really the only way for you to, to, to tell is to take a diagno uh, diagnostic test, excuse me, uh, in both. Um, students may think they, want, they should take the SAT because their school offered the SAT uh, or their friends are talking about the SAT, but you might be better at the ACT. Try out both, see which one fits you best. Everybody's different uh, and go for it. But just keep in mind the ACT, they do not offer computer, uh, so they do not offer paper-based tests anymore. Uh, so the only way you're allowed to take the ACT is on a computer uh, and that might affect you. So you might be practicing using paper tests at home. You might buy a test book or um, do some lessons with somebody, um, but then in the test center, you will be on a computer. So keep that in mind. Uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see some average scores um, and every school is slightly different. You'll see, you know, Caltech is near perfect on average, which is absolutely insane. Um, so keep, keep that in mind uh, that remember the ACT goes up to a maximum of 36 uh, and the uh, SAT is a maximum of 1,600. So um, I hope this helps you guys. There's so much stuff to talk about with the SAT and the ACT, um, but for the uh, purpose of this presentation, we really want to focus on the U.S. admissions, the U.K. admissions for universities. So I do hope that helps. Um, thank you so much. I know we're a little bit over right now, but um, at this point, if people do have any sort of questions, um, please feel free to you know voice those in in chat. You can unmute yourselves if you like, uh, or type those or, or type those in and let us know. Um, otherwise, you can see our emails are down there on the bottom of the screen. Uh, also, the school's email is in the bottom left. If you want a copy of this, please feel free to ask. Um, and uh, we'll be able to give you more personal feedback if you do have questions. Uh, okay. All right. I guess we'll leave it there, guys. So I hope that was really informative enough for you. Um, I hope that we answered all of your questions. Uh, again, if you do have anything else, please feel free to leave it in the chat below when we post this video um, or else um, give us a call anytime. So thank you so much thank you. and um, enjoy the rest of your weekend, everybody. All right. Take care.